partnership with Interdata. Today's webinar is focused on when digital technologies in the sharing econ economy help reinvent the energy sector. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over the telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Doing so will eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. If you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option and a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pen you should use to dial in. If anyone is having any technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at 888-259-3826 for assistance. If you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you use the questions pane where you can type it in. If you're having any diff diff um, difficult viewing the materials through the webinar portal, you will have PDF copies of the presentations at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training, and you may follow along as, your, as our speaker presents. Also, the audio recording and presentations will be posted to the Solution Center training page within a few days of the broadcast. It will be added to the Solution Center YouTube channel where you'll find other informative webinars as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. Finally, one important note of mention before we begin our presentation is that the Clean Energy Solution Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solution Center Resource Library as one of many best practice resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. Today's webinar agenda is centered around the presentation from our guest panelist, Dr. Anne Lorraine Vernet, who has joined us to discuss why energy firms need to reinvent how they do business. Before we jump into the presentation, I'll provide a quick overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Then following the presentation, we'll have a question and answer se session where the panelists will address questions submitted by the audience. At the end of the webinar, you'll automatically be prompted to fill out a brief survey as well. So thank you in advance for taking a moment to respond. The Solution Center was launched in 2011 under the Clean Energy Ministerial. The Clean Energy Ministerial is a high-level global forum to promote policies and programs that advance clean energy technology, to share lessons learned and best practices, and to encourage the transition to a global clean energy economy. 25 countries in the European Commission are members covering 90% of the clean energy investment and 75% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. This webinar is provided by the Clean Energy Solutions Center, which focuses on helping the government policymakers design and adopt policies and programs that support the deployment of clean energy technologies. This is accomplished through the support in crafting and implementing policies relating to the energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools such as this webinar. The Clean Energy Solutions Center is co-sponsored by the governments of Australia, Sweden, the United States, and with in-kind support of the government of Chile. The Solution Center provides several clean energy policy programs and services, including a team of over 60 global experts that provide remote and in-person technical assistance to governments and government-supported institutions, no-cost virtual webinar trainings on a variety of clean energy topics, partnership building with um, development agencies and regional and global organizations to deliver support, and an online library containing over 5,500 clean energy policy related publications, tools, videos, and other resources. Our primary audience is made up of energy policymakers, analysts from governments and technical organizations in all in countries, but we also strive to engage with private sector, NGOs, and civil society. The Solution Center is an international initiative that works with more than 35 international partners across a suite of different programs. Several of the partners are listed above and include resource organizations like IRENA, and the IEA and programs like SE for All, regional focused entities such as ECOWAT, Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. A marquee feature of the Solution Center is, provides is a no cost expert policy assistance known as Ask an Expert. The Ask an Expert service matches policymakers with more than 60 global experts, such as authoritative leaders on specific clean energy finance and policy topics. For example, in the area of energy sector strategies, we are very pleased to have Alexander Och. CEO of SD Strategies strat as one of our experts. If you have a need for policy assistance in energy sector strategies or any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this valuable service. Again, this assistance is provided free of charge. If you have a question for our experts, please submit it through our simple online format, cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash experts. We also invite you to spread the word about this service in your networks and organizations. Our speaker today is Dr. Anne Lorraine Vernet, who's an assistant professor of the strategic management at Green Noble School of Management in France. Her research focuses on how firms in the energy sector develop initiative business models in response to the 
energy transition, and on the role of business models in sustainable transition. And with those introductions, I'd like to welcome Dr. Anne Loren to the webinar. So thank you, Katy, for uh, the introduction. Um, and, uh, and hello to uh, everyone. Um, so uh, before I start uh, actually with the, the webinar, I would first like to thank the Clean Energy Solutions Center and Ena uh, Data for giving me the opportunity to uh, to do this webinar. And I also want to say a few words about the school uh, where I am from. So uh, I am from uh, Grenoble Ecole Management. It is a French uh, business school uh, created a bit more than 30 years ago. Uh, we have about 8,000 students. Um, and we have eight research teams, one of which looks at energy management. So that's uh, the team where I belong to. Our team provides expertise on uh, different subjects such as energy efficiency, evaluations of policies, the strategy of companies. Uh, we have a really unique approach that combines on the one hand quantitative research in marketing and economics using econometric analysis and field experiments, and on the other hand, we do research on business models, relying on interviews and case studies. The team is very international, and we are active in writing scientific papers, of course, working on European projects. We also have a master in energy marketing and management, and we have the ambition to develop a share on the, on the topic of energy management. So if you have an interest in possible forms of collaborations with us, you can write me an email or contact my colleague, Karin Sebi, whose contact is available, you'll see it at the end of, um, of this presentation. So this said, uh, let's start with the core of uh, my presentation, which I have organized in three parts. So first, I will make a general overview of the sector. Uh, I will talk a bit about the context, and I will explain how that context is changing. Then I will present five examples of companies that have developed innovative business models that I think try to reinvent uh, the sector. And in the end, uh, I'll end with a few conclusions about what these examples tell us about the ongoing transformation of the sector. So starting with the context, when we think of electricity, we think of a um, sector that is hyper-centralized, we imagine large power plants, like in France, you see a picture, we have a lot of nuclear plants, in other regions, maybe there is a lot of coal or a lot of natural gas. So a lot of large, large plants. In the last years, we have seen also a large increase in renewable power generation. However, most of that generation is still taking place at a large scale. So we have large wind farms, large solar farms, a lot of large hydropower. So Enadata estimates that about 85% of um, the renewable electricity produced worldwide is at a utility scale. So it's, it leaves us only with 15% of electricity that is distributed. Basically, it means we have a hyper-centralized sector with a mix of different kinds of technologies, but it's really, it's really uh, very centralized, even though it is becoming more focused on renewables. Now, if we consider ourselves, citizens, small consumers, the electricity sector is one we don't understand much. Electricity is invisible, it's intangible. Most of us don't know the difference between a kilowatt and a kilowatt hour. Electricity is not something for Sunday handyman, you know, do-it-yourself handyman. If you don't do things right, maybe you get electrocuted or uh, you can initiate a fire. It's like electricity is a bit of a dangerous thing. It is something for experts and it stays in the realm of experts or specialized technicians. For most of us, electricity is a low interest product. It is something that actually utilities often complain about. They say people, they don't care about electricity. Electricity is a low interest product. And in fact, the sector doesn't care too much about consumers either. Uh, utilities, they only interact with us when they send our bills, which we often think are too high, contains too many lines, are not really understandable, it's hard to compare between the offers, or we interact with the sector when we have a technical problem. 
or like when there is a blackout, something like this. So this shows that the interaction between the consumer and the electricity sector, it is not a positive one. It is about paying something or it is about facing technical problems. And there is little space for the consumer. We have been excluded from any decision making since uh, the creation of the sector, in fact. The sector is developed by large companies. You would say, if I want to caricature a bit, it's dominated by old boring men and under the control of national governments and consumers, they have little say in what happens. And I think actually utilities, they were quite happy with that situation because it's easier and that consumers have little say in the system. You know, they can manage things on their own. They have been managing things on their own and, uh, and they like it that way. It's much easier for them that way. But too bad, <laughs> or not, <laughs> depends on whose perspective, there are signs that things are changing. So I want to start first with uh, Isabel Cochet. We are very proud of her in France, of course, because first she's a lady. <laughs> and uh, in the energy world, it's, uh, there are not so many. And uh, when she became CEO of uh, Engie, which is uh, one of the biggest energy company in the world, in 2016, she said the 21st century will mark the end of fossil fuels. Coming from the mouth of a CEO of a company that made all its money by exploring and exploiting natural gas, I think that is quite a statement. So she's telling us actually, yeah, the fossils are, are dead and we need to move on to something else. Then I will move on to another example of a change. Zar Kozumik from Gartner, which is an American research and consultancy company, he anticipates by 2020 that the largest energy company in the world will not own any generation or network assets. By 2020. It's like tomorrow. This suggests quite a shock. You need to imagine you have a sector where companies were making money by producing as much electricity as possible money and value so far is and has been in the production assets. And what Zumik is suggesting is that this value will move down the value chain, that it will be in the services that most money will be made. This opens the door for many new actors. You can think of Google, who bought the star, a smart thermostat Nest a few years ago, or all the first at the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas earlier this year around Amazon smart home devices. I mean, even IKEA sells PV panels these days. So value is moving down the value chain. It is not anymore in the production. It is associated in the services and that creates opportunities for many firms from other sectors to try to get their piece of the cake. So my last example of the change is uh, coming from the utilities themselves. You know, how do they feel about this? And I recently talked to the head of the Smart Energy Lab at Eneco. Eneco is a Dutch energy supplier. And he said to me, it is clear that the old business model is dying. And by that he means the business model of producing and selling electricity on volumetric tariff. So I sell as much of electricity as possible. The old business model is dying. It is not so clear, however, that a new business model is resurfacing. And he continues saying that everyone in the business wants to make the same revenue and the same margins as they did before with the new activities. And that proves very difficult. So what he's saying is that if the energy dinosaurs want to survive, they will have to completely rethink how they do business. They will have to stop focusing on themselves, on their large power production, and they have to start focusing on their customers instead and on providing customers with innovative services. Borrowing from a concept in design thinking, we can say that until now, utilities, they focused on doing things that were technically feasible and that were economically viable. This is how they have been considering doing good business so far. And the ongoing change suggests that beyond these two aspects, they will have to start thinking about what is desirable for customers. That's not so easy because as we said earlier, electricity 
is a low interest product. I think if you would ask your family and friends, maybe even yourself, if you would ask what it is that you would like as a new energy service, few people would have an answer. So utilities, it means that they cannot rely on their existing customer base to get ideas about what customers will want to have tomorrow. They have to imagine latent desires in customers, never knowing whether these will materialize or not, whether these will lead to the development of sustainable business or not. It's quite similar to the early days of the smartphone. Nobody thought we would like to have this kind of objects. And actually, when firms asked people what they wanted, people mostly responded, I want a smaller mobile. Well, if you look at what happened now, <laughs> it's quite the opposite. And by developing smartphone, Apple they proposed something that's completely new. The firm identified a latent desire in customers to the point that today we cannot imagine our lives without a smartphone. So something similar has to happen in the energy industry. And I think that would be even more complicated given the fact that the industry is not known for its creativity or for its innovative potential. So now in the next part of my presentation, I will present you five firms that are trying something different. They are trying to identify latent desires in customers and build new businesses around that. And all these examples, they are coming from uh, European companies, in fact, Dutch and German companies. Uh, the first example is called Wind Central. Wind Central is a small Dutch company that was set up in 2011, so it's quite a few years old already. The company builds its offer around the observation that most people, they cannot own renewable energy generation because they don't own a house or they don't have land on which to install a turbine, and actually a wind turbine costs too much money if you want to buy it by yourself. So what the company does is that they are looking for existing turbines which are on sale. They split this turbine into pieces. You can see that a bit in the, in the picture. They call that wind dalen, or we could say pieces of turbines. And then they crowdfund these turbines. So each piece delivers about 500 kilowatt hour of power per year and costs between 250 and 300 euros. You could say it's uh, between 300 and 360 dollars. So I think they are quite affordable for many people. So customers of Wind Central, they become co-owner of a wind turbine. And Wind Central sets up a cooperative that helps to manage uh, the turbine. So each co-owner is invited to participate to the annual meetings where decisions are made about the operation and maintenance of the turbine. I want to stress that it is also not only a crowdfunding project where people invest money and get some kind of uh, interest in return. What Vin Central proposes is that uh, you can deduct the amount of electricity produced by the piece of turbine you are the owner from your electricity bill. To do that, they have set up a partnership with a Dutch renewable energy supplier. It's called Green Choice. Uh, so what happens is that people, they can really see on a monthly basis what it means to be the owner of a turbine, because every month they see their bill being reduced by the amount of power they have been generated with their piece of the turbine. And Vin Central, they also develop an application like you can see on the right hand side, so people can see daily how much electricity their piece of turbine is producing. This brings electricity very close to people. So that is the first example. Uh, Vin Central, which is about sharing uh, actually the production of electricity. The second example, and maybe my favorite one, it's called Fonderbron. Fonderbron means at the source. It's also a Dutch energy supplier. It started operating in 2013, and they present themselves a bit like the Airbnb of the electricity. So basically, they developed a platform that brings together renewable energy producers, so mostly farmers, in fact, and end consumers. So consumers, they can choose where their electricity comes from. 
You can see that on the map in the right hand side of the screen, which shows where the producers are located in the country. And customers, they can choose also the type of renewable electricity they like to buy. So we have solar in yellow, we have wind in pink, and we have biomass in green. And then each producer uh, proposes a price. They don't differ so much, you can also see that on the screen, but, uh, but that, that are your options. And then each producer, they get their own personalized page where they have the chance to say a little bit more about themselves. So if, for example, we would click on uh, the family van der Weyck from Lelystad, Lelystad, it's one of these places that, you know, the Dutch, they have a small country, they thought it's too small, so we will reclaim some uh, land from the sea. Well, that's what they did there. And now there is a lot of farming activities uh, going on. So if we would click on family uh, van Weyck, Harry and Marielle, they tell us that they grow potatoes and they are sugar beets, and that for, for some years now, they decided to invest in solar energy because they want to contribute to the energy transition. So if you like family van Weyck, you need to hurry because there is only enough power for one more household. And you can see there is a little circle and there is a little one next to the bonhomme. I don't know if you can see very clearly, but at least for this one, there is only one. The one on the left has uh, almost 600. So you can see how many, uh, how many offers um, are still uh, possible for people. So from the brand, they really give the possibility to producers, to, personalize, to consumers, to personalize their offers. And once a year, you also get to, uh, the possibility to pay a visit, if you want, to the family van Dijk. Why not? Then you get to see where your electricity is coming from, really. So when I presented the, this company to uh, French utilities, they told me, actually, what Van de Braun is doing is that they are able to give a color to the electron. They give the possibility to choose where the electricity comes from and we, which producer my bill is going to finance. So that's from the bond, giving a color to the electron. Now, the third example is Dutch again, and it's called Power Peers, uh, where they also say energy from the car, which they translate as share your energy. So this uh, supplier is a bit more recent. It was launched in the summer 2016, so actually that's uh, not so long ago. And the idea is a bit similar to the one I just presented, so it's similar to Front de Prone, but uh, so they propose a platform that brings together producers and consumers, but they go a step further than Front de Prone. So Front de Prone, they focus on medium scale production by farmers and power peers, they actually allow anyone that has some kind of renewable energy production to sell its surplus to others. So rather than choosing a single producer, people can select a mix of producers. I once talked to one of the founders and he said to me, power peers is really like a marketplace for households among each other. I can provide my neighbor, my parents and my friends with solar energy I produce on my roof. So in his idea, the future of, uh, of energy supply will be something from the crowd for the crowd. That way, the company also hopes to get some kind of snowball effect where people will invite one another to join the platform and trade their electricity. So how does this work in practice? Well, it's quite similar to from the home. Energy producers, they all have their own page where they get to advertise their production. And consumers, they can select up to 10 different producers. So you can have your friend, your father, your neighbor and uh, some bigger production also uh, that you need to, to be selecting, like wind farms somewhere in the North Sea, for example. So you get to select a mix of producers. And you can either do that once for the duration of your contract, or if you want, you can do it every week. For, for example, I go on holidays uh, for the weekend to Amsterdam. And uh, I have an application developed by PowerPeers, and it shows me that there is people producing electricity close to where I'm staying in, the, in my hotel or in my Airbnb. Then I can decide that for the weekend, my electricity will be coming from someone located in the area if I want. 
What is interesting here also is that you don't only find farmers or households that sell their power, you also find local supermarkets, schools, or sport club. So if you look at the photo that just appears, you can see a very modern ice skating ring where there is about 4,000 PV panels that have been installed. As you may have seen during the last Winter Olympics, Dutch people are really fond of ice skating, and they are also really good at it. It's like a national hobby. I often complain to my husband, who happens to be Dutch himself. I said to him, you know, it's not possible such a small country wins more gold medals than France at the Winter Olympics. I mean, they don't even have mountains. The highest hill might be like 300 meters high, something like that. Anyway, if you are a fan of ice skating, like most Dutch people are, and you are a customer of Power Pierce, then you have the possibility to buy part of your power from the stadium where athletes, athletes will uh, be training. So that's what Power Pierce allows. It allows people to exchange electricity. It is from the crowd for the crowd. Then the fourth example is German. It is called BG Energy and uh, was launched at the end of 2014. This company uh, focuses on the idea that people, they are fed up with the large utilities, with the increase in electricity prices. In Germany, it's a bit different than France. We don't pay so much for our electricity yet, <laughs> I would say. In Germany, prices have risen a lot since they, uh, they implemented the energy vendor or the energy turnaround initiated after the Fukushima accident. So they decided to, to phase out nuclear, in fact. So they, are, they think that more and more people, they are fed up with the increase in energy price and they want to be autonomous or at least want to have more autonomy. So what they propose is uh, that people invest in solar panels, maybe in a storage system. You can see in the picture on the left side uh, that they work in collaboration with Tesla. It's actually funny because most of the utilities I talk to, they are really keen on working with Tesla. It's like they made themselves almost indispensable here. Anyway, so they propose to people to buy PV panels and a storage system, and then they give them advice on the size of the components that they need, depending on their consumption profile. So they look at the size of their household. They look at the type of equipment that they have, these kinds of things. I hear you think, oh, that's not so interesting so far. Well, no, indeed. But that's not the core of the offer of BG. In fact, the core of the offer is what you see a bit more in the middle of the figure. They have developed some kind of a smart box. It's a smart box that compiles information about weather predictions, so they know how much the PV panels will produce and when. They learn from your consumption habits, and so they are able to provide you with tailored advice about when you should program your equipment. So when should you launch your laundry to be running your laundry on your own PV panels so that you are sure to consume electricity when you are producing it. They can also control equipment with that box, like an electric boiler if you have it, for example. So they are able to help you to optimize uh, that your consumption takes place as much as possible when you are producing. What they do also is that they propose to supply the remaining electricity, so you only have one contract with BG, um, and they have a partnership with a renewable energy supplier for that, and they guarantee you that you will pay BG for the service of optimizing your energy um, usage and for this remaining uh, renewable electricity uh, price, and they guarantee you that you will save 50% on your electricity bill because you are optimally using your equipment. So that was how they started, actually. That's the initial offer. What they did next, uh, I think that was just a year ago, it was to propose to connect all their customers in some kind of a virtual power plant. So what they promise is that um, you pay a flight rate uh, to BG, so every month you pay a single price, and the same price, whatever what you consume, and when you don't have enough electricity on your own, then you can get your electricity from someone else in the network of customers of BG. In fact, that way people, they become 
independent from large utilities because they are becoming the utility themselves. So by bringing all these uh, households with PVs and storage together, they are becoming the utility themselves. So that's what BG um, is doing. It's helping people being more autonomous, getting rid of the utilities in fact. And the last example uh, is called Jadlix. It is a Dutch example again launched in 2016. The idea of JEDLIX is to say, well, we have more and more renewable energy sources which are intermittent and difficult to predict. So we have PV that only produces when the sun is shining. We have wind turbines only producing when the wind is blowing. So it's intermittent and we have more needs for flexibility in the system. At the same time, there are more and more electric cars around and expectations are that electric mobility is the future. Even the German car industry, which was very reluctant at the beginning, has now accepted that and started developing electric cars. So Jedlix thought, why not using the flexibility of the batteries to provide services to the electricity grid? So they want to use the batteries of the cars as a buffer, in fact, for the electricity uh, grid. This has a double advantage for the grid. First, you can help manage the intermittency of the renewables because you can use uh, yeah, the battery as a storage. Second, smart charging electric vehicles is also really important to limit the investments that uh, will be needed in the distribution grid. So here in Grenoble, we have uh, recently done a barometer asking French experts about the impact of electric vehicles on the electricity grid and their answer is unanimous. EVs will require huge investments to be made in the distribution grid to accommodate for this new usage. So if we want to reduce the investment, we need to, smart, to, to charge the cars in a smart way, not everybody at the same time when they come back from work at 6 p.m. So what JetLeak did is that they developed an application that owners of electric vehicles, they can download and use for free. So when they want to charge their cars, owners of EVs at home or maybe in the city or wherever when they are shopping, they can decide either to charge normally, so as fast as possible basically, or they can decide to charge via the app. And what the application does is that it will charge your vehicle when there is a lot of renewable electricity production and when the grid needs electricity consumption to increase. So it, it has a connection actually to, um, to uh, the electricity markets and it knows when the peaks of productions are and when we need to be consuming. So how does that work? You go to a charging station, you launch the app, and then you need to enter two things. You need to enter when are you planning to leave and you need to enter whether you need a full battery or not, depending on what you are planning to do next. And then JetLix will decide when it is best to charge your car. So what's interesting is that JetLix sells your flexibility to network operators and they get paid for uh, smart charging cars. You would say nice, they make money uh, by using my car. But no, actually what they also do is that they share part of the gains with their customers. No? So you get the app for free and actually every time you charge your car with the app, you save a little bit of money. So individuals, they can also benefit from the flexibility markets that are being developed. They can also participate to this. You know, it's not just the utilities profiting, but I, uh, owner of EV, can also, uh, can also benefit from that. Of course, the longer you have to charge, the more flexibility you can provide and the more money you can make. So that's what JetLink uh, is doing. It is allowing people to make money by selling their flexibility. So these were my uh, five examples. To conclude, um, we have seen that the energy sector is ongoing deep transformation or is about to experience deep transformations. I think it's not all of it we have seen yet. And for companies, this means that instead of developing business models that are focused on themselves, and on their centralized power production assets, they have to develop business models which place consumers at the center. 
And this is quite difficult because it requires a complete change of mindset and because nobody knows for sure what customers want or will want tomorrow. Even though it was in the title of my presentation, I didn't use yet the term digital technology or sharing economy, but most of the examples I presented have a lot to do with that. All are made possible by the use of digital technologies. We've seen the apps, we've seen the platforms, we've seen the smart box managing all kinds of data. So digital technologies, they are really a key enabling technology which makes it possible for firms to propose new things, new services. In fact, utilities, they will have to master digital technologies if they want to be able to develop tomorrow's energy service, if they want to stay in the game and if they don't want the GAFAs to take over their place, in fact. Also, most of the examples are presented have to do with the sharing economy. Vincentral, it's about co-owning a turbine, Van der Braun, it's about developing close relation with one's electricity supplier. Power Peers, it is from the crowd, for the crowd. BG, and especially in the virtual power plant, it is about bringing people together so that they can become the utility. So the sharing economy is starting to change the sector. In some ways, it's quite surprising because uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, electricity is a low interest product. So it's not something one would think people like to share, you know, or care about sharing. But actually, that's exactly what these business models are trying to do. They are trying to empower customers, raise their interest for electricity, so that it becomes possible to sell something else but electrons. You know, they have to find ways to make money outside of selling electrons. And I think by, yeah, by building on all these ideas of sharing, it's maybe one way forward. In strategy, we often say that every industry has a business model recipe. It's like a generic business model that every firm follows and fine tunes depending on the customers they are trying to target. So like in the electricity sector, companies, they are making money by selling large volumes of electricity. The question is, will any of the examples presented become the new industry recipe? Nobody knows for sure. I have my opinion, of course. If you want to know, you can always ask me later. But nobody has a crystal ball. And that's what makes things really scary for utilities and also very exciting for us uh, researchers. One thing that is for sure, I talked to many utilities in the last years and they all tell me the same thing. The firms who will control customer relations will corner the market. How will they do that? Is it with the smart thermostat? by inviting themselves at home? Is it by allowing peer-to-peer -peer exchanges? I don't know. Who will do that? Is it the GAFAs that are the future utilities? Or can energy suppliers still preserve their place in the future ele electricity sector? This question is in the head of many utilities these days. And they know that it is really time to focus on their customer relation. This is something that any firm that has an interest in the sector should do focus on customer relation because that is where they will, yeah, that is these companies who manage to do that, that will corner the market tomorrow. That's it for the content of my presentation. Uh, here you can see uh, the contacts, my contacts, the contact of Karin if you are interested in collaborating with the team. And uh, I thank you all for your attention. Wonderful, thank you so much for that outstanding presentation. Um, as we shift to the question and answer, I'd just like to remind all our attendees to please submit any questions they may have for Dr. Renee using the question pane at any time. During this, we'll also keep up several links on the screen throughout for a quick reference to, to point where we're to find information about upcoming webinars and previously held webinars and how to take advantage of our Ask an Expert program. We've had some great questions. So our first question is, who initiated the companies you spoke about today? Um, so, uh, Vin Central is just initiated by, um, by uh, an entrepreneur outside of the sector. In fact, somebody who had knowledge of finance. Van der Braun, it's a bit of the same. It, uh, it is three small entrepreneurs who initiated, uh, initiated the company. 
All the other examples, they are actually uh, startups initiated from utilities themselves. So uh, Power Peers, it is a big Swedish energy company called Vattenfall that has uh, uh, initiated uh, the offer. BEG, it's uh, started by a renewable energy supplier in Germany. Jedlix, it's started by Eneco. Uh, I mentioned them also at the beginning uh, using one of their quotes. So it's also a Dutch uh, utility. So you have a mix of uh, people that were outside of the sector, uh, just entrepreneurs, and also utilities who are initiating things by themselves because they feel they, they also need to find a way forward. It's really a mix of the two. Very good. Thank you so much. And are you, are you finding these initiatives to be really successful um, or having a lot of barriers? Uh, that's a good question. It's often a question I get when I uh, present this. I'm like, I presented this a year ago to French companies and were telling me, you know, is it successful? Well, sometimes I think it's a bit harsh to ask if a uh, company is, is uh, recently created. But uh, if we take uh, Vincentral, the first example with the crowdfunding, in the Netherlands, they were the most success successful crowdfunding uh, ever initiated. So by themselves, they are successful, but they are small. There are still a few employees only, and I think the, their business model is too complicated to have the possibility to really grow uh, and get bigger. Yeah. Uh, if we look at the second one, the um, Airbnb of the um, electricity from the Brown, from the Brown, I think it's quite successful for many reasons. Um, now they have more than 100,000 customers. So if you think of a sector, uh, the electricity sector, where people, they don't change. Suppliers, I, I suppose it's the same in the US, but in France, it's a few percent of people who change suppliers. Uh, in a few years, getting more than 100,000 customers, and they are like more than 300 employees, I think it's quite a success. And it's also a success because actually you can see, uh, and especially in the Dutch context, that other utilities, they are trying to copy their model. So for example, NG has activities in the Netherlands and they propose something that's exactly the same. So you, you of course, not exactly. <laughs> it's, uh, they don't go as far, but the idea is the same. So you have one page where you can choose if you want to have um, hydropower from the French Alps, or a wind park which they own somewhere on the North Sea and they had one a solar farm which was sold out in a, very quickly. So in that sense, I think it's also quite successful because many companies, they are looking at what they are doing, thinking, wow, actually that's interesting and, uh, and uh, trying to interpret that from, for themselves. Uh, for Parapir, it's a bit too soon to say because uh, they were launched not so long ago, and actually I had difficulty finding uh, the numbers, how, you know how far they are. Uh, for BG, the one on autonomy, uh, clearly this idea of having people pay a flat rate, uh, that is something that many uh, companies are looking at now. So uh, I can imagine that in that sense it's quite successful too, because many companies will be copying. Um, at least the idea of that. And the last one on the flexibility, um, actually uh, Renault, so a French car producer, has been investing in that uh, company uh, recently. Uh, I know that other French car producers have started to initiate something very similar. Actually, they are trying to copy, in fact, what Jedlix is doing. So in that sense, I think, yes, uh, it's also successful because, uh, yeah, you get a lot of imitation. Other companies do, do similar things. So it depends a bit on the, um, yeah, on the example, if they have a potential to grow and really make a difference. Um, but I think most of these examples are quite a success at this stage. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Our next question is, what are the most important regulatory and market design changes that are necessary to enable these kinds of customer-oriented business models and also allow them to scale? OK, that's a very good question. And uh, <laughs> especially because you know I'm French, uh, and I talk about Dutch and German companies. Yeah, And why is that? Well, Clearly, because the French regulatory system is not very compatible uh, yet with innovation. In the Netherlands, what they did, 
is that very early on they liberalized the sector so they allow people to choose um, the energy supplier so that is one in France we are allowed to choose but in fact we had regulated tariffs people would not have any incentive to change so the first thing is that you really need to have people who have the possibility to choose the supplier of their choice and uh, another thing that I think is important in the in the Dutch context and that helps to have more uh, variety in the offers is that uh, as an electricity producer, so I'm a small farmer, I have a, I have a, a few turbines, I, uh, you need to find the best deal for your energy somewhere. You know? And in the beginning, of course, it was not so good for them because they had all these big companies uh, not really interested in their power, they were paying them little money, uh, but over time, it created a space for actors like Van de Brom, for example, or, or others. There are actually many in our examples in the Netherlands who are uh, offering more for the renewable. So I think this is really key. And I, if I look at the French system where everybody sells their electricity to the same one big company um, that, uh, that doesn't allow... Uh, yeah, it's, it sounds like you want to protect the small producers, but in fact, on the long term, you are preventing any innovation from taking place. So these are the two things, really, I think. Um, customers need to be able to choose. And then, of course, uh, it's beyond regulations. But if I look at, in the Dutch context, there has been a lot of um, NGOs activities also. Uh, for example, um, some years ago, like 2013, just when uh, Van de Braun launched their offers, people, they realized that they were buying electricity, renewable electricity, a lot. In the Netherlands, uh, it's one of the European countries where they consume the most renewable, but they don't produce it. So they realized all our renewable, they come from Norway, you know, or Scandinavia with cheap hydropower. Uh, so they get the certificates, and the utilities, they get the certificates saying, yes, I have uh, renewable energy, I bought it very cheap. Uh, in Norway, and I can sell it for big money, actually, to the Dutch consumers. And uh, and there has been a lot of, uh, they created a term for that, I don't know how I can translate. In the Netherlands, they call it Schumel, Schumelstrom, it means like um, not so good uh, energy. And they make a ranking of the companies showing, uh, you know, who is selling green energy that is actually uh, locally produced. And that has really changed the mind of people. Uh, and now many of the renewable uh, suppliers, they are starting to feel like, oh, you know, the problem, it's not the customers, the problem is actually finding local production. And I think uh, all that really makes uh, the sector attractive uh, for companies to, to develop innovative things. So it's not just regulation, I think it's also a bit the civil society, how they, you know, uh, yeah. I empower people, um, yeah. Thank you for that explanation. Our next question is, do you see the utilities reacting to this business model by acquiring or investing in new service startups, or are they growing similar services organically? Well, uh, it's a bit both. Uh, you really, you see both. Uh, so for example, uh, the last uh, model I showed you, it's an echo. And ECO, they develop uh, jet leaks by themselves. So they really uh, develop things on their own. Uh, if you look at, uh, if I look at NG, for example, uh, they, they are more into acquiring uh, all kinds of uh, startups or SMEs, in fact, it depends. So it's really a mix. I think uh, that depends on the strategy of the company. I think it also depends on how different it is uh, if it's possible for them to do it on their own, or uh, or if it's something that they that they will need um, they will need to have the the skills from elsewhere. So if you take BG for example, BG it is started by a company that is called MVV, uh, Mannheim something something. So so it's some place in Germany, they have this renewable energy co uh, energy company. And uh, so they started a company by themselves, you would say a bit organically, but not alone. They started it with four other partners. Uh, among uh, one was a, a software company, 
they had uh, the company uh, with skills in data management, uh, PV uh, company. So I think some of these offers, they are too complicated for uh, utility to develop on, on their own. So either they buy out somebody who can do that, or they have to develop partnerships with others to be able to develop these, uh, these solutions. And to follow up that question is that you said briefly that you presented some of the examples of energy utilities. How did they react? Is this something they feel is potentially da dangerous for their business? Yeah, that's also, a, that's also a good question. Actually, it's funny because um, I, I presented this to French uh, companies. In the Netherlands, it's clear uh, they all know what's going on, they all see what's going on, and actually the share of the big utilities has been decreasing, so it's still big. I think it's still uh, the three biggest still have 70% of the market, so it's still a lot. But it used to be like 100, you know, <laughs> and every year it's uh, the share is smaller. So for them it's clear, I mean, they face it every day. Um, when I presented that to French companies, they were a bit more skeptical. I think uh, they think they are hoping that uh, the Dutch is a small place, a bit funny, you know, these people. I mean, they allowed uh, cannabis uh, <laughs> years ago. <laughs> no, I don't know, it's a stupid joke. But uh, they, are, they are thinking, they are hoping that the Dutch sector is quite special and, uh, and I think the U UK sector is also special and that's why, that's why it works. And, uh, and, and, and I think it's just, uh, in French we say, it's like an ostrich that puts their head in the ground. I don't know if you can say that in English, but you know, they want to ignore what's going on. And so it's easier to say, no, it's not working than actually uh, doing something about it. So it's a mix. Some of them, I think they are really ignoring and hoping that it doesn't come too quickly, you know, that Van der Braun tomorrow starts to have the same Airbnb of the electricity in France as they have uh, as they have in the Netherlands. And, but if I look at NG, for example, NG is trying uh, in, to innovate in all kinds of directions, and that is also because they are realizing that, you know, things are happening, and, and France is just a small market. I mean, uh, they have markets everywhere. So then if they don't innovate for us, <laughs> they will have to innovate for others, I guess. So, um, yeah. That's a bit of the reaction. Sometimes they feel like, wow, what is this? And uh, this is uh, this goes too far. It will never work at home. And uh, but I, I think it's yeah, it's a, a sign of weakness, in fact, that they are not able to see that really it will come and uh, yeah, and and they will be affected as well in a few years' time. Very good. Thank you so much. Our next question is, could you please comment, would there be problems with the stability of the grid if all the suppliers started to propose these initiatives, these measures? Well, this is a question, uh, actually I often get that question also when I, when I uh, present these examples. And actually, I think the question is, is uh, poorly asked. And uh, why do I think that? Because, you know, if we only think uh, this, uh, these initiatives, they will create problems. Uh, it's not taking the problem in the right uh, way, you know. These initiatives, they are there. There will be more of them. I think these peer-to-peer -peer platforms, we can expect there will be more of them. Uh, so instead of thinking, you know, it will create problems. We, we need to realize that these things will be there. There will be more. People will start exchange electricity. Um, and instead, we need to look at solutions to make uh, to make this possible, you know? Uh, it, so we should not look at it as a barrier, you know? It's a barrier, it will create problems. We sh should look at it as the sector is changing, consumption patterns are changing, and we just need to adapt the technology, the infrastructure to that. That is just, uh, that is what we need to ask ourselves, you know? It's a new boundary condition. And, uh, and we need to deal with it and not look at it as uh, it's going to cause problems, you know. It, maybe it will cause problems and we need to, and I'm sure they are, uh, we have brilliant engineers that can uh, develop brilliant solutions. And that is what we should focus on instead of, you know, just saying it will cause problems and we should block these things because uh, that's not the way forward. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, during your presentation, you gave an example focusing on autonomy. Um, however, why didn't the company not focus on the full autonomy? 
Um, that's a good question as well. Um, so there are many reasons why it doesn't make sense, uh, economically speaking, for a customer to be fully autonomous. Uh, you know, if, if you have to invest in a battery that is big enough to store all the power you need, you need to invest in a really big equipment. So, um, so that I think that is one of the reasons. Economically speaking, it doesn't make sense if you are if you would be located very far from the network. Then, of course, uh, of course, you need to look for autonomy. And and here in Grenoble, we have uh, beautiful mountains with many. Uh, uh, huts where you can sleep and where they have PV panels and uh, and they sometimes have also even hydrogen storage. Uh, so that's in this context, it makes sense to go for full autonomy. If you have a network, uh, then I think it doesn't it doesn't really make sense to invest because you need to invest in huge uh, solar production, huge batteries, um, and uh, yeah, it's maybe also a little bit too risky. Yeah, you can use the the grid is there. It has a purpose, and uh, and we should use it smartly. I think that's uh, that's one. And actually, there is another example of a, um, a company that tried something. It was a pilot project. Uh, they were saying, you know, what we need to do because if everybody buys a storage for themselves, you use it very little. In fact, uh, you need a big storage to use it when you know just when you have a peak consumption in the evening. But in fact, it's very little at the time you use it. So they thought it would be interesting to invest in a big storage. You put it somewhere in the neighborhood, and then you you make it work like a bank. So people they can put their electricity when they have too much. They can take it out when they have uh, not enough. But because you do that with offices and uh, inhabitants, you have a mix of uh, consumption, then you, you use the, um, the battery much better, much more, so it becomes cheaper for everyone. So I think this notion of autonomy, it doesn't make sense at a single household, economically speaking, and maybe also technically speaking, but it, it could make sense on a more microgrid level or, or, or like they do it in BG, you know, at, a, at a more national scale. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that informative Q&A discussion. Uh, now I'd like to ask Dr. Verne to provide, a, provide some um, additional or closing remarks before we end this webinar today. Dr. Verne? Yeah, well, uh, I just hope everybody enjoyed the, the presentation and learned some uh, at least uh, nice things, interesting things, new initiatives. And uh, I would be very curious to know uh, what people, you know, which initiative talk to, to people. Uh, so if uh, anybody wants to uh, email me back saying, well, I really like this one or this one didn't talk to me much, uh, just I'm curious, it's for my own, uh, my own personal interest. But uh, that's it. And thank you, uh, thank you everyone for, for still being here. Wonderful, and thank you so much for such a wonderful pre presentation, and I'd also like to extend a thank you to our attendees for participating in today's webinar. We very much appreciate everyone's time and hope in return that you take away some valuable insights to your ministries, departments, or organizations. We'd also like to inv invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about the Solution Center resources and services, including our no-cost policy support through our Ask an Expert service. I invite you to check the Solution Center website if you'd like to view the slides and listen to any to the a recording of today's presentation, as well as any previously held webinars. We are now also posting the webinar recordings to the Clean Energy Solution Center YouTube channel. Please allow about a week uh, for these audio recordings to be posted. Finally, I'd like to kindly ask you to take a moment to complete the short survey that will appear when we conclude the webinar. Please enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solution Center events. And this concludes our webinar.